and you, you better memorize this one. All we live sheep have gone astray. Uh, another raise of hands, and you fail if you raise your hand. Uh, how many have not gone astray? Mm -hmm. See, that's that actually, though, is one of the challenges. You do realize one of the reasons why Jesus was rejected by his own people was because they thought, since they were the end people, because they were the chosen people, they also thought um, we're better than everybody else. At least we're not like them. And you know that can happen to church people too. We can take and we can look at the mess that's around us and uh, and and we can forget what's now over our doorways. Did you notice that today? You are now entering the mission field. Right outside that door are people Jesus died for. Right outside that door, there's messy people. Right outside that door, there are folks with a boatload of baggage. And the worst thing we could do is to take and look at them and say we're better than them. And we turn our nose up at them. I mean, that's just not, it's not right. There were people in Jesus' day who thought they were better than everybody else and they did not hear the message. And I think sometimes we miss it too. We are healed because he took the brunt. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone on us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When he cried out on the cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You do realize that at that moment, at that turn in history, the Son of God for the first time in history was separated from his Father and that all the vengeance, all the anger of God against everything we have done wrong rained down upon his Son, for you. That is a significant event. And here's the writer of Hebrews, I, I mean, of Isaiah, I'm sorry, uh, writer of Isaiah, 800 years earlier, says, he took it for us. That was our bullet. He took it. That was our arrow. He took it. He was, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Remember him before Herod and Pilate. Remember him before the Sanhedrin. What did he do? They're cursing him. They're ridiculing him. They're charging him with unspeakable crimes. And what did he do? He stayed silent. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That lamb of God went on that cross and did not cry out, hey, wait, I'm the Son of God. Let me off of here. He did not cry out to the angel, hey, come and vaporize all these folks and get me off this thing. You know, he could have said those things too. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And it's for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, why he was in a borrowed tomb, remember that? And all that only happens to the wicked. Only someone who's cursed yeah, has no place to have his body laid. And that was Jesus. But then there was Joseph and there was Nicodemus, remember? And with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Are you getting the picture that Isaiah is painting? Yet it was with the will of the Lord to crush him. You mean God was in on this? I've said it before. Boy, if we could just realize how smart God is. The next time you think you're pretty smart, just remember if you're in a battle of wits with God, you're in the losing end. And that crucifixion is a great example of why we are in the losing end in a battle of wits with God. That was a murder plot by evil men. And God turned it around and he made it into our salvation story. That's pretty phenomenal if you think about it. 
And that's just what Isaiah is talking about here. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You see how what a phenomenal chapter this is in the Bible? <laughs> Don't just memorize verse 5. Memorize all 12 verses. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? Well, let me tell you how far this goes. Seven times it's quoted in the New Testament, verse 5. Seven times it's quoted. And one, we're just going to relate one of the stories. I think it's great. Because basically it's, uh, it's one guy saying, well, I'm glad you're reading that. Let me tell you about my friend Jesus. And we find it in Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. It's remote. Now, growing up in the east, I didn't know what that was. When I went out to Montana, where you can drive 100 miles and not see another car, I know what a desert road is like. Just drive through the Badlands. Hey, you get a real, you, number one, you understand why they call it the Badlands. Um, there's Philip. Hey, go there. You've got some evangelizing to do. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, a queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, I've got a little short Ethiopian friend. I've got a lot of little short Ethiopian friends, but Dundee's even short by Ethiopian standards. And every time he gets to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, he giggles. I don't know what it is about it that makes him giggle. He just giggles about the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and so here's this Ethiopian, verse 28. And he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So just imagine this court official, he's seated in his chariot. It's probably a pretty nice rig. There's at least one person that's up front driving, and he's pretty comfortable sitting in the back, bouncing around, reading the scroll of Isaiah. And there's Philip running along beside him. Well, we, we'll get there in just a second. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So that, that means run, dude. And so he ran. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And this is such an important verse. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. You know, I have a preacher's heart for the way a church ought to be run. It grieves me that the hardest thing in the United States of America in our churches, is to get people to do home Bible studies. This verse is an argument for you to get active and have your own home Bible study. Number one, it can't be a bad idea if the first century church was built with that model. This was just how they got together as a group. But the real work that you see described in Acts is in those little home churches. And just what the Ethiopian said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? You know, all God wants in your life is you to open your eyes to your neighbors that are around you. That some of them might just be curious about the, the Lord. They might be curious about the Bible. And they won't cross through that doorway, but they'll come to your house and have a cup of coffee. And you can open up the book and you can sit down and talk to them. And just what the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone guides me? Guide a few people, if you will. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, 
about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with scripture, and he told him the good news about who? Jesus. Yeah. And this is what happens next. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And they can't, they, they think they know where this little bit of water is. And it's significant enough on this desert highway or deserted highway that, uh, um, that they could get in and baptize him. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. And that still blows my mind. Suddenly, the guy who leads you to Jesus and baptizes you, boom, he's gone, and you run away. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah praise the Lord. I love that story, don't you? Well, let's look at this sermon in a cup as they're passing out the, uh, the communion. And we'll, so we're going into this time of communion, but I, I really want to wrap this up and, and actually get us to Thanksgiving at the same time. In a weird way, you know, one, one title you can give for Isaiah 53, we've, we've got 1 Corinthians 13, it's a great love chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, it's a great resurrection chapter. I think Isaiah 53 could be called the great guilt chapter. Because you take and you look at it, and boy, is our sin all over. Uh, but it's the great Thanksgiving chapter, too. Because you take and look at it, and praise God, Jesus died on the cross for me. I am as guilty as guilty can be. Now, our problem is we don't really understand what that should do for us. And, and I've loved this movie since it came out. And if you guys remember... When it came out, it was there were still a lot of World War II veterans that were alive. And most of the World War II veterans I know, they, they actually had to leave the theater during those opening scenes of D-Day. Because it was so realistic. It, it just brought back, flooding back the memories. And, and it, um, what a story that we find in, in Saving Private Ryan. Tom Hanks plays a captain. Um, Matt Damon plays Private Ryan. And here's how the story goes. Uh, the big brass find out that Private Ryan's brothers have been killed in action. So they order a task force to go and find Private Ryan behind enemy lines after D-Day and rescue him and give him back to his mom. And the story is as much about the captain that Tom Hanks plays and his men as they go on this rescue mission. It, it takes forever before they even get to Damon. And in the meantime, most of his men die. All but two of the men in the original crew die on, on you know, the mission, including the captain that Tom Hanks plays. Right here, they've stood their ground at this uh, little town as a German force comes through, and they, despite overwhelming odds, fight off the Germans, and Ryan is among them. And in this closing scene, Tom Hanks' character is taking a service pistol, and he's shooting as a plane, as the plane is strafing him. He takes some bullets, and he's laying there, and he's dying. And he gets that, that poignant moment when as he's breathing his last he has Private Ryan lean over, lean into his face, and he says, earn this, earn it. Now there's some bad theology in there if you want it. Here's the problem. When it comes to atonement, we didn't have to earn it. You don't have to earn it. But something amazing does take place as we take this cup and we realize what's going on. There ought to be something called gratitude that takes place. Now the movie at the end does a reversal. It was a flashback. The very, very beginning of the movie, 
there's an old man at the cemetery in Normandy. All the white crosses, all the stars of David, all the, all the bodies that are laid out there, and he finds this captain's grave. And you don't know who it is till the end of the movie. And he says, did I earn it? These last two weeks have been hard. I, I think I'm kind of grieving in advance. I don't think we realize a lot of times how much somebody means to us until they're gone. I came in Wednesday night and there was a pile of cans and bags and everything that were sitting on the counter. And my immediate thought is, well, who's going to take care of that? Because you know what I what I know. Well, it'd probably be C making that ten mile trip one way from her house coming in, and she would take care of things like that. She would haul bark, put them in the car, and she'd come in here and she'd move chairs. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've heard people say, 